Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Scott Morris. I'm the Director of Business Development for GTS Distribution's Gaming Division, which is a really long and fancy way of saying the board game guy. Appreciate everybody joining us here. This is another one of our live retailer to publisher webinars. Uh, we're going to be talking today with Jeremy and Adam from Funko. Uh, most everyone on the planet, I think, knows Funko from the vinyl pop collection side of the business. Um, but last year, there was a partnership that was uh, put into place between Prospero Hall or Forest Prison Studios and Funko Games. Funko Games is now developing a lot of different things. Uh, we're going to talk about them today. We're going to talk a little briefly about Funko Verse line of games, which is probably the most common one that people are familiar with. We're going to talk about some games who, even as recently as last week, I've talked to some people who are like, oh, I didn't realize that was Funko. Like, it just did, it didn't make the connection yet. Um, but that's the signature line of games. And then we're going to talk about Marvel Battle World, which um, a couple of people have already sent me a message on this, and I'm going to kind of preview it a little bit. But somebody sent on, on earlier today, I put a post on Facebook that we were going to be talking about this new quote everything game um, and people are like what does that mean what is an everything game and I, I had to kind of explain it a little bit but we'll we'll go through and we'll walk through and explain it it is a game that is a little bit of every part of really awesome pop culture geek culture stuff all wrapped into one and we'll kind of talk about that so but I don't want to steal their thunder so um, with that I will just simply say that if this is your first time joining us or if you are a longtime customer you can easily chat and ask questions all you have to do is hover over your video window there's a little chat bubble at the bottom and you you can either send a message to all panelists, which are myself, Jeremy, and Adam, or you can send a message to all the panelists and attendees. In either case, uh, Adam, Jeremy, don't worry about managing that window. I'll manage that. As questions come up, I'll work them into the conversation and let you know. Um, we do have a couple of uh, people that will always try to kind of ping me through Facebook Messenger as well, so I might come in through separately, and I'll let you know if that pops up. Um, but with that, I'm going to take my face that was made for radio. I'm going to let it be quiet. I'm going to let you guys take the floor and show your presentation because you got a lot of awesome stuff to talk about today. Yes, sir. Thank you, Scott. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Jeremy. Uh, as uh, Scott said, I am the sales manager for Funko Games. Joining me today is Adam Minton, and he is the marketing manager for Funko Games. And uh, we're going to do exactly what Scott said. He did save me a little thunder, so we'll talk about it. But we're going to get up and close and personal with uh, a few of our, 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 our hitters this year, and then just kind of give you an overall view of what Funko Games did this year, but get really down into the details of Marvel Battle World because we're really excited about that product and I'm sure you guys will be too. Um, so uh, real quick, you know, like Scott said, you should know who Funko is, but just in case you don't, we have been around since 1998, started with uh, making uh, collectible bobbleheads of some niche license, but since then, the world has taken off for us, and now we are the international purveyor of pop culture. Um, we have offices in the US. I have my crown stuck up here somewhere. Uh, in the US, I think I have the UK right above me right here over my head. And we have offices in Hong Kong as well. And we have more licenses than any company in the world. Now, who's Funko Games? Uh, Scott did talk about who they really are, but we didn't know who they were when we first started working with them. See, about a year and a half ago, we actually more than that, about two, three years ago, we decided with all of these cool license that, licenses that we have, they needed a game. We needed to make a game out of them. Problem was is that we had zero idea on how to make games at Funko. So we reached out to the good people at Forest Prison Creative. They had just an excellent track record of working with publishers that you've probably already heard of, Ravensburger, USAopoly, Hasbro, tons of others. And uh, working closely together with the Funko team, FPC made Funkoverse, and I heart that game big time. Funkoverse, in case you don't know, is an ever-expanding universe where you get to play with your favorite characters from worlds like uh, DC Comics, Harry Potter, uh, Golden Girls, just tons of them, and we're constantly adding to it. And it was, and we loved it. We loved how it turned out. And working with FPC went so well that we decided to make them part of the Funko family. Um, but we didn't know what we were getting into when we first bought them because, as Scott mentioned, Funko uh, FPC had an imprint, a nom de plume. Uh, called Prospero Hall, and that should probably get your antennas going crazy. 
the same team that made that cre created uh, the award-winning Villainous, Horrified, Jaws, they are now making games exclusively as Funko games. So uh, a lot of pedigree comes with these, these folks and they've been doing a stellar job. So why, now that you know who we are, now that you know who Funko Games is, let's talk a little bit about what is happening for us this year. So uh, forgive me, I'm sort of new at Zoom. Scott did his best to get me, to turn me into a black belt as soon as possible, but we'll see how this goes. So um, bring up the presentation. I'm still only a red belt, so there's always room for improvement. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so here we go. So tell me, so we got Funko Games. Um, this is our update for our product line for 2020. Um, we acquired FPC about a year and a half ago, so 2019, uh, started with Funkoverse, but in 2020, we absolutely went crazy and in a good way, crazy in a good way. Um, here you can see some of our Funkoverse titles that we added, but uh, all titles included, we did 35 titles this year this year. Now, some of these are going to be uh, in the same line, but man, it just kind of gives you an idea about how hard the Funko Games team is working. Uh, I also have, oh, here's a lineup of Funkoverse expansions that we did this year. I have a better slide for this. This kind of gives you an idea about what's happening with Funkoverse. Folks, if I haven't said it enough, I really love this game. I'll tell you, the licensor pro licensors will probably have my head for saying it like this, but this is how I see the game. It's just imagine a world where Sophia from Golden Girls throws a cheesecake at Marty from Back to the Future, but he uses his hoverboard to get two spaces away to safety, but he's not quite safe yet because in this space right behind him, Jaws pops up. I mean, this is the world that we're building. Essentially, it's awesome to have a game where you get to play these characters, but as the collection grows and the stories that each customer can have just gets crazier and crazier. And, and I heart this game a lot. So, but we're not just Funkoverse. Uh, we started off as Funkoverse and Funko Games has quickly moved into uh, its own line of signature games that have, don't have to do with Funkoverse and are already making big splashes in the board gaming sector. Um, here you can see uh, we have Five Nights at Freddy's, coming out. We have a, a long a list of holiday games that you can play. Um, and then obviously the breakout sort of performances this year, which you'll get to get a take a look at is going to be Pan Am, Back to the Future, Back in Time, Godzilla, Tokyo Clash, Disney's Haunted Mansion. Very excited to talk to you about that one. And then of course, uh, Marvel Battle World, which you'll get a real up close look at today. So um, now, Let's see if I can do this right. Before we get into our next slide, I have a little bit of goodness to show you. I just got to figure out how we get there. We go. So we're going to stop this puppy. Yeah, the easiest way is probably to stop it and then restart and then have those check boxes like we talked about and you'll be good to go. Boxes are checked. That's right. It is going to be back to the future. Um, this has been a game. It's obviously with this being the 35th anniversary of back to the future this year. Uh, we are very excited about having being able to bring this game out at the perfect timing. But uh, man, did it come out cool. Basically, uh, if you're a fan or if your customers are a fan of this movie, there is going to be so much in this game that they are is just going to tickle them. Uh, the, the folks at Funko Games just did a stellar job of just dissecting the movie and all the parts that made it so iconic and working them as an element into this game that you'll get to see. But uh, without getting too much into it, I would love to, I'm going to pass this over to Adam so that he can give you an up close look at some of the cooler features and the, the awesome selling points uh, of this game. Adam? Yeah, thank you. So hey everyone, I am Adam. I'm the marketing manager over here at Funko Games. 
Um, so starting off with Back to the Future, Back in Time, um, just so everyone knows, this was actually the first uh, signature title that we released uh, as Funko Games after Funkoverse. Um, and when we released it, it released in early June, it almost instantly sold out worldwide. So uh, we had to scramble a little bit, get more units back in stock, uh, was able to get everything back in stock around midsummer, and we have a nice uh, flow of product now. Um, but this has been a huge hit. Um, you know, one of the amazing bits of feedback we got was that it actually won the Dice Tower Seal of Excellence, which doesn't come every day. So that was a great moment for us, you know, our first, first jump out of the gate, uh, you know, right after Toy Fair being nominated for multiple game of the years. So that was a good feeling. Um, so back to the future, back in time. This is a, first of all, just gorgeous piece of art. I always like to show the box art for all of these. Um, you'll notice that these games seriously jump off the shelf. Um, everything we do is original art. So you can see it's, you know, DeLorean getting struck by lightning right at 10.04 PM. And actually that is the plot of the game. So the game takes place over the course of the first movie. So it's, you're basically living out the first movie, but you're making it your own experience. It is a cooperative game for two to four players. So you're all working together and you have two win conditions. Both things need to be met at the end of the game. So you need to have the DeLorean repaired and on the main drag to get ready to get hit by lightning at 10.04 PM. You also need to make sure that Marty's parents, George and Lorraine, are in love. And there are some really fun ways that we keep track of these different elements. So there are amazing uh, fan touchstones. Jeremy uh, touched on this just a second ago. But you know, this is the rule book. It's also the comic book that the kid is reading when Marty lands in 1955 in the barn. Um, what we do with all of our rule books, they're all very straightforward. If you're familiar with some of our other titles, um, they're very clean, very understandable. And uh, we always have how to play videos for all of these uh, larger signature games. So um, th that is one element. And that, like, I'm just gonna show off some of the really cool features that make this game unique. So this is a dice rolling game at its core. Um, what's great though, is that throughout the game, you're uh, as one of the four characters, you're gathering new powers, which let you manipulate the dice more and more. Ah, yes. So these are the player boards. Uh, as you can see, Einstein here, um, you can see that he has different powers. So you get to roll dice and then you can use those powers to manipulate them. So you start off the game basically being able to roll dice as a basic move or action. Um, and then as you progress through the game, you get more power to manipulate them. So, you know, some of these really fun touchstones about the game. We do have a three-dimensional clock tower uh, that you uh, place on the board. And what's really fun about this, I said it's a dice rolling game. Well, the clock tower is also a dice tower. So fun little fan moments like that, things that make it stand out um, from other, you know, other titles that you might see out there. There's an extreme attention to detail in this game. So this is the DeLorean figure, for example. So you can see the art deco on that is stunning. You can actually see the brand name. You can actually read the license plate. Oh, I think you can see it. It says out of time. Right, so really stunning uh, pieces of art throughout it. Um, Jeremy showed the, the game board earlier. You can see it's this beautiful blue motif. And then I did say that you need to make sure that George and Lorraine's parents are in love. So the way that we keep track of that is we all remember the Polaroid from the movie that Marty has that slowly starts to fade away as he's messing up the timeline. Well, we, recre we recreate that in the game and I don't have all the tiles because I can't do it vertically, but we can see the photograph. This is actually the love meter. So you're making sure that they're in love. If at any point they're not and you have to do a love check, well, the photograph slowly starts to fade away. So really fun, unique elements that, you know, gamify these moments in the movie that make you feel immersed. Um, it plays in under an hour, it's ages 10 and up. So if you have families going through your store, this is a really great signature experience, especially for those parents that want to introduce 
um, this new movie to the children. And also this is for anyone who is a fan of the movie. As Jeremy said, it is the 35th anniversary of the title. Um, so this has been a signature that is a signature title that's been very high in demand. It's performing very well, critically reviewed, um, easy sell to anyone who walks into your store. Yeah, if we had thought a little more about this, we would have actually done the webinar on November 5th, not November 2nd. <laughs> but I have to, have to deal with the timing of that sometimes. So, but um, I did just put also in chat, um, just so everybody knows, um, I put a link to um, the Funko Games, uh, kind of a list of everything in terms of what's coming out future to past. Um, so you can click on that. The Back to the Future game is also in there. I put the direct uh, skew in there for people to see that. We do have stock of that in Arizona, Florida, and Washington right now. Um, but I had made a mention in there, just so everybody knows, if for any reason your local warehouse doesn't have any, let us know. We can either get things to there from our warehouses, you know, interchanging them, or we can immediately get orders and get stuff moving from Funko because they're very quick on turnarounds on anything. So that shouldn't be an issue. Absolutely. Uh, as, as Adam mentioned, ages 10 and up, two to four players. Uh, suggested retail of $29.99. When you see this, folks, on the shelves, it looks like it could easily be a $50, a $50 game. It was definitely, we do everything high end, and Back to the Future was no different, uh, was no exception. So um, absolutely tons of, ton, thank, tons of great points to bring up to your customers. If, they're, if you ever see them kind of looking at the box, you, you have many great things to kind of mention to them. If they're a fan, they're going to love the way this game turns out. Uh, next up, we have... Godzilla, Gojira, Tokyo Clash. Uh, I am the resident Funko Godzilla Kaiju nut. Um, when I heard we were doing Godzilla, I was I was both excited and also nervous because it's like, how is this going to turn out? Um, when you love something as much as as, as this, you always want to make sure that it's done right. And I am very happy to report uh, that it was the 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 figures themselves look stunning. Uh, you're doing things like throwing trains like they do in the movie, folks. If there's ever going to be a kaiju board game, this is the way. This is this is the way to do it. Uh, I'm going to let Adam also get up and close with personal with some of the good selling points of this game, uh, just so that you know what to say to your customers when they're looking at it. Adam. Yeah. So Godzilla Tokyo Clash. I was talking about with Back to the Future. Um, you know, when when Prospero Hall, uh, now Funko Games. Um, approaches a title, we want to make sure that we're paying fan service to exactly what people want out of a game that has that title. So Godzilla Tokyo Clash is that movie moment at the end of every good monster flick where they are in the middle of the city just battling it out. Um, in the game, you can actually, you know, pick up the trains and throw them at the other kaiju. You can pick up the other kaiju and throw them into buildings. Um, so it's a really fun, visceral experience. The feedback that we're getting on this title is that it really is that game, finally, that makes you feel like you are battling as these ferocious monsters. So uh, some of the ways that we do that, I'm just gonna jump right into the really good stuff. We have four massive miniatures for the four kaiju that are in the game. Um, so yes, so that's, that's a close up of some of them. I have the rest here. So this is Megalon. So we get a lot of love for Megalon because he doesn't get a lot of attention, but you can see these are, you know, larger than my hand. Um, and then we also have King Ghidorah. You can see that these are all sun dips, so you can really get all the texture and the detail with each. They're just really beautiful sculptures. This is Mothra herself. So you can see her again, all the details. She actually comes on a stand, so she is floating above the game board. And then finally, the king of the monsters, Godzilla. So really stunning uh, sculptures, really fun to play with. They feel good in your hands as you're moving them around the board. The board itself is a flexible hex tile configuration. So you lay down these tiles uh, and depending on the number of players determines how big the game board is. So if you're playing with more players, it flexes to a larger size. And if you're playing with fewer players, it's a little bit smaller. That way you're right in the action immediately. You're not starting on the opposite size of these giant boards. You're face-to-face -face, uh, battling it out instantly. The way the game works is every kaiju has their own deck. So you can see that this is Mothra's deck. So as you're going through each, uh, 
Kaiju has unique powers, unique abilities that they can activate and use on their turns. So the way that you deal damage is let's say I was Godzilla and I threw, let me pull out one that has a trophy value, great. And I threw Mothra into a building. So you can see down here, there are these trophy points. So I would actually be taking cards out of the, com the competition's deck. And by doing that, I gain that trophy value, but I'm also weakening that Kaiju because I'm taking away some of their powers. So really fun, unique um, scoring mechanic in there. And again, this is another title that really has that signature um, unique style to it. It is instantly recognizable as Godzilla. It harkens back to that classic vintage movie poster. There is the Japanese kanji throughout the game. So really, you know, really beautiful. Um, Jeremy's going to talk about the competitive price point, but this is a, another title, um, which you'll hear a lot during this presentation that should be way more expensive than it is. <laughs> yeah, Manuel just made a comment. He said, this game sounds sick. That is a yeah. great way to say it. Uh, yeah, it, it's one of those games that when you first look at it again, like you can just see there between the four that are over Adam's shoulder between Pan Am, Haunted Mansion, Godzilla and Back to the Future. They're all very unique and they all stand out in their own kind of ways. And um, Godzilla, I can tell you from working with someone who is very, very, very passionate like Jeremy is about Godzilla. There is a there is a level right there is a I expect my stuff that I love to be like this. And there has been a lot of really good response to that Godzilla game. It's really, really cool. And and a friend of mine asked me the other day, he said, what, what's the Godzilla game like? And I said, it's everything it should be. And he's like, <laughs> okay, that's all I need to know. Right? Like, that's it. So, it was pretty cool. Scott, I just love the way you present these, man. You, you're a <laughs> I love it. That's my job, dude. I'm the board game guy. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Good company. So, I'm just lucky uh, enough to be passionate about it as well. <laughs> <laughs> the um, It's important, man. You got you got to do what you love. Absolutely. The game itself is 10, ages 10 and up, uh, also two to four players. Um, $34.99 suggested retail, and your customers will be blown when they find out what all comes with this game. I'm back in. That is how good Godzilla is. It destroys your internet. <laughs> it, it crashed everything. Yeah. So hang on one second here. So we're, we're slowly starting to get people back in here. I am very, very sorry about that, everyone. Apparently, something happened with our Zoom account and decided to completely crash the, the webinar. So we're slowly getting people back in, which is good. It looks like Jeremy's okay. here and Adam's here. Um, that's how good Godzilla is. It just breaks the internet, yeah. <laughs> so, literally. So we'll, we'll give it a second here. I apologize greatly about that. I'm not sure exactly what just happened. It, it popped up and gave me an error saying that there was a second webinar that started, which doesn't make any sense at all because we only have one webinar. Yeah. Um, but hopefully we can get everybody back in here and get started. At least you guys are in, which is good. Yeah. Um, Jeremy, you are still listed as video presenter one. So I'm gonna change your name to Funko Jeremy, like we talked about. Okay. And we'll get that all set up. What was the last thing you heard? Last thing I heard was you were talking about the price point and the age group for Godzilla and then everything kind of disconnected and, and gotcha. went okay. off. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, anyone who's just rejoining, I apologize for that. Uh, something happened uh, with Zoom. I'm not sure exactly what it was, but uh, the joke, of course, is that that's how powerful Godzilla is, is that he just broke the Internet. <laughs> so um, we can uh, it looks like most people are back in, which is good. So if we want to pick up from where we were, we were talking about Godzilla Tokyo Clash. The good thing is this is still recording, which is not a problem. So I can edit all that and get it all back together. And I'll try and find some fancy little fun thing. If you guys have any images of Godzilla you want to send me that I can use, I can create some kind of like a <laughs> destruction graphic or something or whatever we want to do. So. You gotta keep appropriate yeah absolutely something yeah it's just like literally you started talking about it and i'm like wait a minute what the heck just happened and and then it all <laughs> then it all went downhill real quick you so. actually do smash satellite towers in the game so there you go that's that's how that's how 
deep Funko goes into development. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Fully immersive. That's and to awesome. those of you that are playing uh, webinar bingo, internet crashing, go ahead and flip that slide. That's over. right. <laughs> We're looking next it, for cat butt in the camera lens. It's 2020. So, I mean, what else would we expect? Right? Exactly. <laughs> so, all right, uh, cool. Well, let's kick it back over to you guys and you can get continuing on with everything. Absolutely. Uh, I think last time we were just leaving off of Godzilla Tokyo Clash 34.99 on the shelves. Next up is let's see if we can get this. To Jeremy, just so you know, when you're sharing, it's actually showing um, it's showing a different screen than just the presentation. So I don't know if you have two monitors and it may be showing the wrong one. I just want to make sure we get the full shot for the retailers. Sure, thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, it, yes, Man, Manuel just made a comment. Yes, everyone got disconnected all at once, Manuel. It was not not just you. No, nobody was singled out. I, everybody got disconnected. It's it's like Oprah, and you get a disconnect, and you get a disconnect, and everybody. So, Manuel, your comment about Godzilla being sick was just too much for the internet, man. I, I guess so. so. <laughs> what happened? Uh, so, what are you seeing now? Are you seeing the nice slide? Yes, Pan Am is up. Awesome. Yes, this is the darling. This is the this is our sort of our breakout darling of the year. Uh, Pan Am, absolutely stunning game. Um, you play a fledgling airline, sort of trying to do your best during the time of Pan Am's sort of heyday. Um, lots, to, lots to get up and close and personal on this game with, so I'm going to let Adam go ahead and do his thing on this one. But this game has absolutely taken the board game sector by storm. This talks a bit possibly, well, I don't want to jinx anything, but we might see some awards for this game uh, coming here pretty soon. Adam? Yeah, so um, Pan Am, you might be wondering why Pan Am? Um, well, we actually worked in very close partnership with Pan American Airways to develop this game. Um, and we, again, wanted to make you experience uh, and what this one is, uh, this is the rise of Pan Am. So as Jeremy said, you're playing as a fledgling airline competing with each other, also competing with Pan Am. So the game takes place from the 20s to the 70s following the the um, uh, the height of Pan Am, and I'm, I'm really trying to avoid puns now because I made a pun in the last no! webinar. We and need those though. <laughs> <laughs> well, this game has really taken off. So, um, as you can see behind me, uh, the Pan Am box is really striking. It's that gorgeous Pan Am blue with the spot UV treatment, and everything about the game has this vintage aesthetic to it, harkening back to that glorious glamour day of when people were jet setting around the globe. You would dress up in a nice suit or a dress and you would get served a meal on a plate. It, it, the art and the style really harkens back to that. Um, but at its core, um, this has been a critically reviewed game, um, a real knockout. It's already on uh, many reviewers uh, top 10 lists of 2020. And there is a lot of buzz about um, game of the year from uh, several of these key reviewers. So we're very proud of this. Um, I just wanna kind of hint at the pedigree behind this game. Um, so it is a worker placement game. And when you think about worker placement games, there's probably a title that jumps to mind. Um, so this is not a marketing point. We don't put this on anything. Uh, we sign all of our games as Prospero Hall because we do have 30 people in the studio that work collaboratively, collaboratively to develop all of these games. But the lead designer on this uh, was Peter Lee, who actually developed Lords of Waterdeep. So there is a real solid pedigree behind this game, um, you know, past what, uh, you know, we can really take any credit for. Um, so in this game, you are traveling to exotic destinations. So we kind of call this ticket to ride for the skies. If anybody's asking how this works, it really is a mashup um, of uh, ticket to ride, of power grid, and of um, uh, water deep. Water deep, Lords of Water Deep, because the work <laughs> placement. Thank you. Exactly. Thank you, Scott. There's been um, several reviewers so, that made that comment too. Yep. Uh, so it really, you know, the, these are destination cards. This is how you gain landing rights in the different cities. So really stunning. So you're building um, airports, you're purchasing more uh, advanced technology as far as aviation so that throughout the game, you're able to travel further and further across the globe. Um, you know, Jeremy kind of showed the map. We do have a gorgeous rule book. 
it is very approachable. So this is a hobby game. This is for uh, those that really uh, want a true uh, hobby title experience. But for anyone new, we do have a um, flight attendant who's gonna walk you through your first game. Um, Becca Scott from Geek and Sundry did an awesome how to play video. We actually sent her the Pan Am uniform uh, with the regulation hair and makeup and it's fantastic. Um, you know, I talked about building your fleet of airplanes. We start with these adorable little planes that can go short distances, but throughout time, as uh, you know, we get further and further into the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, you're able to unlock larger planes that can go further distances. And then finally, in the late 60s, we develop the jet. So this can go, you know, halfway across the globe. Um, there, you know, the the board game the the game board is too large for me to hold up right now, but I do encourage you to check out this image that Jeremy's pulling up. It really is um, a unique perspective of the world, really classic, really vintage. Um, you can see in the middle of the game board here the event cards. So there are real life events that happen, and these events are randomized each playthrough. So things like the stock market crash, things like World War II, um, they actually happen throughout the game and affect, you can see at the bottom left-hand corner, the stock price of Pan American World Airways. So the point of the game is to build your fleet, but then also sell it back to Pan Am. As Pan Am is growing, they're gonna give you a nice payout of cash. And then you're gonna turn around and invest that cash back into your own airline, but also in stock in Pan Am. And the player with the most stock in Pan Am at the end of the game, because Pan Am conquered the, the aviation circuit, um, is the winner. So really gorgeous uh, design here. We have you know, a mixture of everybody's favorite gameplay elements, right? Route claiming, bidding, uh, you know, auction elements and worker placement. So it really is this dynamic, fun game for anyone who's looking for a nice, rich gaming experience. Yeah, when you were talking about this being the darling, I think the most interesting thing about this title is this is a this is an IP that if you were to just get 10 retailers, gamers, 10 hobbyists all around a table and say, what IP should we go after this year? <laughs> I don't think anyone would put Pan Am on that list. And yet yep. it has taken off because it, it is it is a very familiar game, but it's a very new game. And I think that appeals to a lot of people. There's mechanics in it that people love and are very familiar with, but they're kind of presented in a whole new way, which is really cool. Um, it's a very tactile game, being able to pick up the planes and put them on the routes and see very quickly and very visually, what do I control? What do I own? What do my opponents control? What do they own? Um, and it's something like, for example, in my family, I have a 12 year old and a 14 year old and we've played it with them and they've absolutely loved it. And then we've played it with adults and they've absolutely loved it. So it's a game that kind of spans the generation, so to speak, pardon the pun being that the, the you know, Pan Am license is older. Um, You're in there was, company with those, man. You're in that's great. Right. with those. <laughs> there was a retailer that said, please tell me TWA is in there. TWA is not in there. It is purely a Pan Am license. The, the, the companies that you run are independent companies that are being bought up by Pan Am as time goes on as adam mentioned so but who knows I mean, you never know if, if this does well as i always say if sales are great you never know what happens so twa may be on the horizon but i'm bump okay <laughs> <laughs> good night everybody no i'm kidding yeah okay. no. uh, no, no. it, it's it's actually a, a great point great points that scott brings up um it, not only are we you know it, it does sort of get close to familiar elements that you're used to but We've just taken those elements and done them so well, all the way from how the gameplay happens. And as Adam mentioned, the art, I think I heard rumors of people getting, uh, Adam, is this true? Or should I keep saying this or not? That someone reached out to us to try to get poster sizes of our location cards. Oh, several people. So we don't have them, but you yeah. know, maybe next time we do conventions in real life, it'll be a nice piece of swag, but <laughs> we don't yeah. have them yet. Yeah. It just it just kind of goes into sort of the creative minds at work, man, and 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 of bringing a great game developer like like uh, Forest Design Creative and Funko and just what the two of our powers can do combined. So Pan Am, uh, it just tended up again, two to four players, uh, retailing for thirty four ninety nine, and you know it sounds like I'm a broken record, but you, anytime that one of your customers asks how much the game is and how find out how much it is, they are going to be very very pleasantly surprised. 
So and just so retailers know, I did put the SKU into the chat window as well for Pan Am. We do have stock of Pan Am in Washington and Florida right now. Uh, we also have purchase orders open with Funko to get that delivered to Missouri, Florida, and South California as well. Um, so those are in motion right now. They're flying their way there. So <laughs> feel free to get your awesome. orders in and we will get them out. <laughs> I love it. Okay, uh, next up we have Haunted Mansion. I am so excited to talk about this game. Not only, I mean, this, this is the game that has so many features that are, are, are awesome that you're gonna see Adam uh, talk about right now, but you know, I, I'm a huge fan of Haunted Mansion. I, just the, the ride itself. I may not have as much trivia knowledge as Adam does. He, this guy, I'm pretty sure he has a tattoo on himself somewhere for Haunted Mansion. We'll ask about that someday, but, uh, but this is a huge win for our company for Funko Games because anyone who's a fan of Disney parks knows that Disney parks, merchandise doesn't get sold outside of Disney parks. Well, very rarely does it. And they allowed us to respect, you know, to pay respect to this license. And the Funko Games team really sunk their teeth into it and did so, did such a good job that it is opened up the doors for us to do more, uh, to do more titles like this without going too far into the spoiler world. Um, it's gonna be a great 2021 for Funko Games. And their work on this game was a big part of that. Um, yeah, lots to say, lots to, lots to talk about. So I'll go ahead and stop wasting time and send it over to Adam so that he can show you. So Jeremy, you got halfway to a pun. Uh, <laughs> so, it out, uh, we, really, we really paid our respects to yeah, the <laughs> um, So yeah. <laughs> Disney Haunted Mansion, Call of the Spirits. Um, this is an original title. Um, you know, you'll see those, uh, you know, Jeremy said that those uh, park licenses that are sold outside of the parks, a lot of times are reskins of games. This is not a reskin. This is an original game that we built from the ground up in partnership with Disney parks. Um, they are very happy with the final product as are we. So this is yet again, another title um, with gorgeous original artwork. Um, this is the rule book, but the main box actually has the hitchhiking ghosts featured right on the front. Um, and I'm going to talk a lot about the art in this game because that really is um, not only a huge uh, design win for us, um, but also integral to the game itself. So in Haunted Mansion, you are a guest at the mansion and you are going uh, from room to room to interact with these happy haunts and have a ball with them. So the way that you move around <clears throat> is in the center of the board, you can find, oh yes, leave that image up. I'm going to talk about it. Um, so you will find Madame Leota Seance Chamber in the center of the board, and you can see the endless hallway surrounding her uh, seance chamber. So those are actually the locations you're going to move to. So, um, you know, Jeremy talked about this uh, in our last presentation. I'm going to steal this talking point where, um, you know, when you're on the attraction, the doom buggy is bringing you from room to room. This works in the same way. So in the middle of the game board, there's actually a giant hole, which I'm going to bring out. By the way, this is just the back of the game board. So it's really gorgeous. And then there are the rooms themselves. So everything in this game, you're going to recognize if you're a fan of the attraction. So we have the graveyard. There's the ballroom here. And in the <laughs> middle, there's a hole. <laughs> so in the hole, you place Madame Leota's seance chamber. And you can see that uh, it actually works as a rondelle. It's a turntable in the middle. So you're moving your figures from the seance chamber into the different locations. And then as an action on your turn, you can actually rotate the um, seance chamber. And by doing that, not only are you moving yourself, but you're moving everybody else in the mansion. So this at its core is a set collection game. You're going around and collecting sets of cards. Um, that are all extremely recognizable to the attraction. So we have, um, there's actually over a hundred pieces of unique art in the game, but this is just a very uh, small selection. So you can see the ballroom dancers, one of the skulls that pop up in the graveyard, more graveyard singers, there's Madame Leota herself. There's the, um, you know, transforming portraits in the portrait hallway. We have the stretching portraits. So you're moving around and you're trying to collect sets of matching cards that will maximize your point values. So for example, if you get all five of the singing busts from the attraction, they're worth more points as a set. 
So you're going around trying to collect as many as you can of matching sets, but the catch is you need to be avoiding the hitchhiking ghosts. So beware hitchhiking ghosts. Um, they are also moving around the mansion. And if they cross your path, you become haunted by collecting these haunt cards, these adorable little haunt cards. Um, and they will uh, give you a penalty at the end of the game if you have more haunt than the other players. So again, really gorgeous design, really stunning artwork, um, very immersive into the attraction itself. So it does feel like you are here on this ride, you're moving around. Um, I'm only showing off parts of these different components in each game um, because I don't have enough table space to have everything set up. Um, but it really is, um, you know, I, I will battle Jeremy until the end of time that I am the bigger <laughs> Haunted Mansion fan. Um, but, you know, un until we're in the park and on the ride and pointing out everything about the attraction, we won't know for sure. <laughs> well, I wouldn't do that, Adam. That'd be like trying to go into a dunking contest against Jordan. I, I kind of know better <laughs> in that sense. Um, Haunted Mansion uh, and tons of things to love about this game, especially if you're a fan of Disney's Haunted Mansion. Ages nine and up, uh, two to six players, um, retailing for about $24.99. Uh, so yeah, if you haven't had a chance to get hands on with this one, I really recommend you run and do and so. This was just released, just so uh, retailers know, I put the SKU for this one in the chat window as well. We do have stock in um, Southern California, Florida, Missouri, New York, and Washington. And we have a whole nother round of POs on this one also in motion. So this one has been received very well. And I think a big part of that is it's a Disney license. It's a world famous ride and world famous IP at the right time for the holidays and 25 bucks. I mean, that is, is pretty, if someone were to show me that picture right there without the pricing and, and see the components in the game between the cards and little miniature stands and things like that would not think it's a 24 99 game would immediately think it's more like that 30 or 34 99 price point. So I think this is a perfect storm of great IP, great game, great timing and great price. Absolutely. Uh, and one, one thing I do want to point yeah. out, you know, we're coming right after um, Halloween. Halloween was a couple days ago. In fact, I had to strike my Halloween decorations before this presentation. Um, but uh, we do know that Haunted Mansion is going to be an evergreen title because it is tied in with the park attraction, which is open year round. Um, so this was not intended to be a Halloween release. This is an evergreen title. Um, that you know we we have full confidence in will continue to sell through the holidays and then into next year as well. As we should, it's an awesome game. Uh, we'll be making it forever. Uh, I think Scott brought up a really good point about the price point. You'll find that all of the Funko games uh, that we have are are going to have just an amazing value package for them. Um, and so that's it for Haunted Mansion, and which brings us to I believe once, there we go to Marvel Battle World. Um, like I mentioned, uh, I am the resident Godzilla fan at Funko. I am also the resident comic book nerd. So this is another thing that I, when I heard that we were making, I mean, I grew up with playing Marvel games like Marvel Overpowered, like that card game from the 90s. I have a full collection of lots of different Marvel themed games. So when I found out that Funko was getting involved with it, I was like, sign me up, man. Let's find out what's going on with this game. And it absolutely turned out great. They are tons for people to, to gravitate towards for this game. It's a, it's a collectible card game. It's a collectible, it's, it's a dice one game. It's tons of things and it hits all the marks, but uh, just kind of like how Scott mentioned before, it is a perfect storm of a lot of different great things. Fantastic IP, lots of different pri price points, easily a collectible item, um, but uh, how does it play? How does it work? Uh, for that, I figured we would let Adam kind of bring up the finer points of the product, talk about some different options that we're going to have for it. But most importantly, how does the sucker play? It's absolutely fun. So let's go ahead and let Adam take it away. Adam? Great. And before I dive into this, I just want to do a time check, um, making sure I, I don't... We... The town crier says it's 1121. So um, technically we have about nine minutes left. Uh, sorry, 1121 central time. So um, we have about nine minutes left. Um, but if we need to go a couple minutes over, that's not a problem. Retailers can kind of come and go as they please. And worst case scenario, this gets put on YouTube. So everyone will be able to jump into it. 
Great. So I won't take too long with this, but we do want to give kind of a deeper dive into um, Battle World because this is, um, as Jeremy mentioned, <clears throat> this is a new line. We actually developed it in collaboration with Marvel. Um, so they had a lot of say into the, how this product plays. Um, this is a uh, collectible cooperative adventure game. Um, and what we did, what we wanted to do was take this fad of the blind box experience, right? So people are in uh, your checkout line, they're at the, at the cash, and um, you know, it, it can start as something like an impulse buy. So the signature um, experience of Marvel Battle World is the battle ball. So in this is actually the full game. So you can play the entire game right from one $9 battle ball. So I, yeah, so Jeremy's pulling up um, everything that comes in a battle ball. So what you can see is right when you open it up, there is one Marvel hero. So these are collectible figures. There are 30 figures in series one, plus three additional exclusive uh, figures that you can only get through the different SKUs. So inside there are two heroes, one you get right away when you open the battle ball and the other is trapped inside a Thanos stone. So um, the plot of this game is that Thanos has crossed the multiverse of the Marvel multiverse and captured all the heroes, um, some you'll recognize and some very unique ones that are deep cuts into the fandom and trapped them in these Thanos stones and brought them to this planet he created called Battle World. So you are a hero traveling around Battle World trying to rescue the other heroes. So in the Battle Ball, I'm gonna get more into the gameplay in just a second, but like I said, uh, one to two players because it can be played solo. Um, so that means this is a signature stocking stuffer for the year. You can, if you have multiple children, um, you know, you can put one in each stocking or, you know, uh, one, one of each day uh, to, to distribute those out. Nine, $9 price point, so a lot of bang for the buck there. Then we do have some additional SKUs in the line. We have the Mega Pack, which comes with six heroes inside. There is an exclusive figure, which is Negative Zone Spider-Man with a foil character card that you can only get in the Mega Pack along with five other random heroes. So the only common figure that you're going to get in a mega pack is Negative Zone Spider-Man. And then the other five are different each time. So there are three right when you open the package and then two additional ones trapped in Thanos stones. And that retails for $24.99. So really great way, um, you know, once they get that impulse buy or if they want to buy it as a package, the battle ball and the mega pack, um, once you have more than, well, once you have four heroes, you can play with four players. So two players right out of the battle ball, up to four players, and again, solo play uh, as well. Since it is cooperative, uh, you know, if there's multiple kids playing, then it, you know, doesn't become uh, a, a battle world in your home. <laughs> what, do you think, uh, what do you think, Adam? Should we, uh, should we show them what, what, what the characters are that come with that is a series one? Yes, please. Yeah, let's share it. Here, let me get pull this, pull this up for you guys. You're gonna find you're gonna find some characters in here that are just hilarious. Yeah. Uh, you, obviously, you have some of our some of our. Uh, I would almost call them uh, tentpole characters: Captain Marvel, Groot, Iron Man, but uh, uh, Ultimate Thor. But you're gonna see some really cool sort of niche characters too that will uh, that will sort of tickle longtime Marvel fans: Howard the Duck, Beta Ray Bill. Uh, Crocter Strange. I know that's Adam's favorite, even though he won't admit it. Crocter <laughs> Strange, uh, the zombie zombie Venom. Uh, some really cool, some really cool items. Now uh, characters. Now, just like any other blind, to kind of also mirror that blind box experience that Adam was mentioning. There's going to be different characters with varying levels of collectibilities. You'll have your commons, your rares, and then your ultra rares. You can sort of see those at the bottom. Um, they are uh, infinity stone and powered versions of the characters that exist. So they're like really, they're crisp, they're sort of crystal looking, they're translucent, flat, uh, translucent to match the mirror, whatever power stone that character would sort of mirror, would, would sort of have uh, in this world. But lots of cool stuff, lots of characters to chase after. 
And just so the retailers know, I put a link into the chat that uh, takes you directly to all the different products that are available from GTS for the Battle World product. Um, I think to me, one of the most important things about this line is that it's uh, well, two things. First, eight ninety nine for a Battle Ball SRP gets you everything you need for two players to play the game. Um, that. I cannot for the life of me think of another product on the marketplace that is going to have that low of an SRP for that much inside of a single product for kids to play with at this holiday. Yeah, that's a great picture. <laughs> it's a perfect picture of the battle ball and a stocking right there. I mean, it's just, it's a, it's a perfect thing. If you like Marvel stuff, it fits. And when I was mentioning earlier about it being a quote unquote, everything game, it's part collectible in that there is that, that blind box piece to it. It is part toy. It is part, board game it is part trading card game and it kind of takes the best of each of those and kind of mishmashes them together into this really really cool looking product um so i'm sure adam you may go into a little bit more about some of the accessories and some of the, the gameplay mm -hmm. to it and everything but it's not just cute little vinyl characters there's actually a really cool game behind this as well yeah that's actually you know kind of what we wanted to do we wanted to take the blind bag experience but then give uh, these families something to do afterward right so they open up the package and instead of just bunch of plastic in the trash or collecting dust in a box or on a shelf. Um, this is something interactive that you can do with those figures. I mean, down to the point, you know, we really thought a lot about the packaging and the presentation of this game. The battle ball itself transforms into a stand for your characters as well. So, you know, each battle ball can hold um, two figures, but both halves. So you can see there's a character card that comes with each hero as well as the figure. So that is the, um, the two uh, first, uh, implying that there's a lot more to come, uh, skews of the playability. And then uh, this month, uh, here in November, we are releasing two, uh, we are releasing an accessory and an expansion. So uh, I had this out of the package because I really want to show this off, but this is the Thanos Ship Showdown. So you can actually see here, this is an exclusive um, Thanos figure that comes with Thanos Ship Showdown. Uh, Thanos Ship Showdown adds, I think I just said, a boss battle to the game. So in addition to moving around and trying to rescue the other heroes, Thanos shows up himself and is trying to cause trouble, make it harder for you. Um, there's a lot of really fun toyetic moments in this expansion. So Thanos comes with his own die, um, which is unique to him. It basically represents how far he's traveling around Battle World. Um, but you'll notice that this is, you know, elevated up off the table. And if you use the tower, it actually will roll the dice for you. So you press down on Thanos and it rolls the die. It lands in the bottom of the cup there. So really cute toyetic things. Another toyetic moment is as you're damaging Thanos, there are actually panels on his ship that flip over to show that it's damaged. Four hits against Thanos, you've defeated him. And then the other um, accessory that we are releasing would be, oh yeah, that's a nice close-up of the, of the packaging, really unique, stands out. Um, but then we also have the Travel Portal, which comes with another exclusive figure. So this is Gold Ultron. So you can see he also comes with a foil card. But this is a nice accessory for anyone who's a fan of the game line. It can hold your favorite hero with a clip, so it clips onto your belt or your backpack. Um, it also has a spinner on the bottom that replaces the die that comes in the game. So cute little fun accessory for anyone who's a fan of the franchise. Nice little add-on um, if you're trying to build out uh, the full collection of, of kind of accessories and um, other things. Speaking of the collection, one of our retailers had a really good question. I think I know the answer, but I want to confirm it with you guys. Um, is the Thanos character only available with that expansion? I believe the answer is yes. I don't think he's one Correct. of the 30 characters, right? Yeah. Yep. So Negative Zone Spider-Man is exclusive to the Mega Pack. Thanos is exclusive to Thanos Ship Showdown. And Gold Ultron is exclusive to the Travel Portal. I think the cool thing also is that there's there's no definitive, this is where you must start with this game. You could start with a battle ball. You could start with the mega pack. I mean, there, there's options as to how you want to handle that, which is really kind of cool. And yep. the fact that the mega packs, while the negative zone Spider-Man is static, the other five heroes are completely random each time. If you're a collector, that's a really good option to jump into. Yep. One of the things that I wanted to bring up, and I think it's important to talk about from a, a hobby retail perspective. so. 
Um, we are right now placing orders with this. Um, as I mentioned, I put a, a link in the chat window that you can see where all the different products are available. Um, there's a couple of different display stands for the battle balls themselves that are just different widths and, and different dimensions that you can check out. Um, and then there's the Mega Pack, there's the Thanos uh, expansion, and then there is the uh, Ultra or Ultra Gold, <laughs> the Gold Ultron <laughs> that's available as well. The Thanos is only a $14.99 SRP. The uh, Ultron, I believe, is $7.99 or $8.99, if I remember right off the top of my head. I'm not 100%. I'll have to double check on that one to make sure, but I know it also is a really good price. Um, the big thing that I wanted to point out, um, some people have seen this game in mass market stores, um, and the Mega Pack has been readily available. Those, those have been pretty, pretty out there. The Battle Ball displays, though, are the things that are getting eaten up like crazy. Um, since this game was released into mass, I started looking for it personally, because I'm like Jeremy, I'm a big market Marvel fan, and I could not find those battle balls anywhere. They were super, super hard to find. So those are the things that I think are going to be one of the biggest opportunities for hobby retailers to be able to get a hold of. Um, like I had put into the chat real quick, Derek had asked around uh, ETA and release date. So we're putting in orders right now. We've got a release date of November 30th, so right around the holiday time frame for everything for hobby. Um, but we're bringing in a lot of this to a lot of different areas. So definitely, you know, let your reps know if you have questions about it or any specific item you wanted to get. We can get that on pre-order for you. Um, Derek did ask, are there pictures of the PDQ displays anywhere? Um, and when did the mass, when did the game release to mass? Those are really two good questions. So I'll let you guys answer the timing one. And if you have a picture of the displays that you can share as well. Sure, Adam, do you know, uh, what, what was the exact date when we went mass with this? October 1. October 1, so so, yeah. so, so fairly, fairly recent. Yeah, um, so if you get it in your store, you're one of the few that have it ahead of time, ahead of the holidays. Exactly, um, and that kind of also uh, speaks to uh, to your other question, Derek. Um, I don't have any images loaded up right now of the PDQs, but I'll make sure uh, if you can uh, get your information, I'll provide that information and those images to Scott so that he can support you with that stuff. But you're gonna find that there's a lot of support behind this product in terms of uh, different, different uh, PDQ sizing, just depending on where, how you're planning on merchandising the product. Um, and you won't be actually I am a, I, I just did a quick Google search so I do have an example of a PDQ so I will just share my screen really fast perfect perfect I know there's they exist out there yes <laughs> so you can see here this is an example of one of the PDQs um, that you can get in your store yeah, and they're you know gravity fed, so one one ball comes out, all of the rest drop down. Um, and like I said, I believe if I remember right, there are um, there's two different sizes um, based on the width of them um, and the the count, of course, of of battle balls that come with them. Yep. Right. Depending on how you're going to want to how you're going to want to merchandise this product, there's a couple of different options uh, just to help support you there. And then also, uh, it won't be completely on you to evangelize the game. We have. Um, obviously our assets that you, you'll have access to, but we have an animation studio who is, who is airing cartoons uh, based in, that, that are based on the Marvel Battle World universe that are airing on Disney.com. I don't know if they're, they're I know that's one of them uh, to name a few, but uh, just different things to help, uh, and help generate buzz around this product so that um, you'll have kids or, or just Marvel fans alike saying that they've seen this they see this cartoon, what's the story about Battle World, and you'll be there to help them out. Sure. Um, Derek had a question. I think this is a good conversation to have. Um, I know the answer to this because I have been involved in both sides of the table for these types of deals and discussions, but um, he said, can you explain a little bit uh, behind the reasoning behind the two-ish month mass exclusivity and the time frame there? So uh, I know a lot about that, but I figure it's probably best for them to hear it from you guys. Uh, I'm, go ahead, Adam, if you know that yeah. one. Yeah, so um, first to markets are not uncommon. Um, you know, our studio, you know, we're, we're a long standing studio. We've been around for 20 years um, and retailers trust us. So those mass retailers like Target, Walmart, Amazon.com, um, they do, uh, you know, want to be the first to hit the market. They want to put it on their newness end cap in the store and they want to guarantee that they're able to drive traffic to their store. Um, you know, for those titles. So that's, you know, it, um, different retailers are able to put in bids um, and it's not out of the uh, realm of possibility to have a hobby first to market um, if there's enough demand for it uh, ahead of time. So, you know, I've also, 
Yeah. I've personally sat in meetings um, with very large licensors and I don't want to put you guys on the spot to say that you are required or anything like that, but I do know that there are some licenses that require a mass release and, and require a pretty large hefty commitment on the upfront in terms of the, the timing of things. So um, yeah, it yeah. usually does come into situations like that, which can be kind of challenging and frustrating. Like I'd mentioned though, the battle ball things that the story that I have seen, and this is just me, this is not Funko, this is not anybody else saying anything. This is just from what I've seen talking to people around the country is that um, mass market got their um, the uh, mega packs, which are the ones with the negative Spider-Man. They got one display case of the, uh, the battle ball Balls, and then the restock of those battle balls has not been as fast as the demand for the battle balls themselves. So that that's where I, again, I think that's the biggest opportunity that retailers have right now, especially at a time where, you know, the, there's normally a lot of foot traffic, but there's not a lot of foot traffic because it's 2020, but there's still going to be a lot of parents and grandparents looking for things to get their kids. And Marvel is a pretty safe bet right now for kids, which is, uh, is definitely a positive for sure. Right. And, and just, just like you mentioned, Scott, you, you definitely hit the nail on the head. You know, uh, with, uh, uh, with as much support as we're getting from Disney and from, you know, obviously the folks at Marvel uh, in introducing this, the, there was a lot of requirements uh, that were tied to the license. So that um, with Marvel is going to have a lot of say on, on, on if there's a first to market opportunity. But, you know, while, uh, while we'd all like to have the newest and greatest, uh, sometimes it does offer, offer, just present some opportunities, like Scott mentioned, where now there is a sort of a gap in demand on specifically one part of this product that you, that uh, that retailers that specialty hobby can now actually take advantage on that um, and just sort of start 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 that collectors start having those collectors come to your stores and then and then you have the Thanos ship and you have the next levels for them so that's the great thing about this product is that there's so many ways to support the line to your customers and lots of different price points for that. So um, Adam, are you gonna be able to uh, sort of show us a little bit of this game at all? Absolutely, uh, and I'm gonna do yeah. you know kind of a high level overview of gameplay. So um, somebody give me a heads up if you can see my tabletop now. Good. Yes. Great. So Marvel Battle World, like I said, it is a cooperative game. So what I have set up here is actually a three player game but you'll notice that only two figures are out on the table. And there's a reason for that, which I'll get into in just a second. So gameplay is very simple. It's very streamlined. Um, you know, this is a game that is ages six and up. Um, so it does have that collectible after school feel to it. Um, but, you know, in general, as a high level overview, this is a cooperative game in each location in Battle World, you can either win or lose. And if you get three losses, you lose as a group and then a number of successes based on the number of players. So if this is a three player game, we're gonna start by flipping over location tiles and you can lay these out however you like as you um, lay them out or as you draw them. So you'll see there are three locations for the three players and you'll see this one actually has Thanos stone on it. So we talked about the Thanos stones a little bit earlier and this is that second blind bag experience that's part of the game. So this is a Thanos stone and uh, we don't just, you know, have you open it immediately. It's actually part of the gameplay. So you'll put the Thanos stone on a location that has Thanos stone on it. And this one's a little cracked, so I apologize. Um, as I'm laying these out, I'm laying them flat for the camera, but, you know, they do actually stand up on the tile. They have a nice uh, table, table look and feel to them. So I'm going to be playing with Negative Zone Spider-Man and Dino Thor. Um, which is the most fun word to say on the planet because um, it sounds wrong, but it is correct, Dinothor. Um, so on the hero's turn, you go to different locations. Uh -oh, and so there are different challenge readings. I'm pull this closer. To Sorry, the you're kind of freezing up. Hey, Adam. Am I back? Yeah, yes. come, go back a little bit to when you were just first laying the cards down, man. Yeah, you just oh, kind of froze goodness. for a okay. second. Mm -hmm. So you laid out down the cards in whatever configuration you like. Um, and on the hero's turn, you're going to move to locations and anything that has a Thanos stone on it, you're actually going to put that physical Thanos stone. So this is that second part of the blind bag experience. And we have it part of the gameplay instead of just something you just pop open right away. So we do incorporate this, um, you know, surprise and delight moment into the actual gameplay. So on the player's turn, 
you will move them to different locations depending on each character's strength. So I'm actually going to move Dinothor to where the, um, the actually I'm going to move both of them for sake of time. I want to show this off um, to the Thanos stone location because we want to rescue this hero. So we're going to take the challenge. So this one has a fight challenge and a psychic challenge. Um, and we are going to roll a die. So Dinothor is going to go first. So he rolled a seven. So we're going to take his fight battle number. And every hero also has a special ability. So if you were to miss, uh, we wouldn't advance the threat track, which is how you lose locations. So he got a high enough number. We're going to place him on the first success track. So this represents how many successes each location needs. They all have three failures. So he went, he got a success. We're going to flip his card over to show that he has already gone. Then negative zone Spider-Man is going to go. He's at the same location. We're going to try to get a second success. Look at that, we did. So I rolled a nine plus uh, two because this is, has a fist location. This is his fist score. I actually can't remember the, the names of these different abilities, but green and green. Um, so we've gotten two successes. That's how many we needed at this location. So we get to crack open the Thanos stone. Now in here is another blind bag hero. And I wish we had uh, copies of these in everyone's hands because this is the most satisfying thing in the world. It's like this beautiful meld of a fortune cookie and styrofoam. So you crack this open and inside is another hero. So we just rescued Captain Marvel. So now you're gonna add Captain Marvel to the game. Also inside, in addition to the Thanos stone, there is a sealed card that matches the Thanos stone. So there are numbers on the bottom of each. So you know which one to open when it comes time to rescue that hero. So now we have rescued Captain Marvel and she gets to join the adventure. So that's the high level overview of the gameplay. At the end of the hero's turn, you're gonna flip this and it's either a sun or a moon. Any moon location, you're gonna add a danger token or advance the danger. And again, if you get three uh, levels of danger, uh, you lose that location. If you lose a location, you flip it over put that threat token on it to represent you lost it. If you succeed at a location, you're going to flip it over and not put a threat token. So then at the uh, start of the next hero's round phase, we're going to add more tiles, which add more locations. And actually, I want to add Thanos to the game so that you can see that. So Thanos rides around the perimeter of Battle World. And after the hero's turn, you're going to roll that die. I'm going to show this off again because it's a lot of fun. Oh, I was holding it at an angle, so it fell out. But this will represent how many locations he moves clockwise around Battle World. If you're at Thanos' location, you can try to fight him by, again, uh, using your action to roll the die. If you do, I kind of showed this off earlier, you actually flip panels over to show that he's damaged four bits of damage and he is defeated. If you roll any uh, red based die, then you add danger to the location that he ends on. So again, a lot of fun, really unique element to the gameplay. Um, and that's a very high level overview. I didn't want to take too much time because I know we're over. Um, I think that covers a great, good amount of it. And you can see that, you know, the cards are collectible. So the cards that you put into the game are, are variable. The heroes are collectible. There was a really good question that just got asked on my Facebook account. Um, the numbers that are on the bottom of the Thanos stones, are they tied to specific characters in a way that someone has the ability to see the numbers on the bottom and know what's in the packaging? And I think I know for a fact that the answer on the battle ball is that there's no way to see the, the bottom of those inside of the, the, the battle ball themselves. But uh, I wanted to know if there was uh, any connection there between the numbers and the, the characters. There is. Uh, so the numbers are tied to the characters. Um, so let's say you got a, um, you know, a couple mega packs and you find that some of the um, sealed cards match uh, multiple of the Thanos stones. Uh, yes, there is a code that represents each character. However, you cannot see the code in the packaging. So not right. until you purchase it and open it up will you be able to kind of deduce if you have a spreadsheet handy with all 30 characters, you'll be able right. to figure out <laughs> right. um, which character is which. Um, Derek has a good question. Um, is any of the gameplay changed when you replay and you've already opened the Thanos stones? 
So Thanos stones are, um, you know, you actually crack them open. You can reseal them uh, randomly, um, but they are kind of a one-time experience. Mm -hmm. um, in the rules, if you ever uh, get to a, um, a Thanos stone location and you don't have any handy, you actually just uh, draw draft another character and rescue them and add them to gameplay. But the physical experience of opening that is a one-time thing. Mm -hmm. um, there are some workarounds, um, you know, Tom Basil from Dice Tower uh, had a really great recommendation of getting like Easter eggs, the plastic Easter eggs and resealing them. Oh yeah, that's a great one. Uh, that way you still get that experience of opening something. But yeah, sure. that once you once you break the Thanos stone, that hero is rescued uh, mm -hmm. as far as your collection is concerned. Yeah, but for eight ninety nine to be able to get a brand new moon battle ball whenever you want to, it's really cool. Yeah. So that pretty much covers, I think, uh, our presentation for awesome. the world, right? Is, is Adam? I think I think that kind of covers everything. Yeah, I mean that covers uh, five of our thirty five titles we released this year. <laughs> I just want to kind of draw yeah. attention um, really quick. We're on the stocking stuff. We're on holiday purchases right now. So we do have a line of Christmas uh, card games. So there are five iconic movie card games. Um, they're not reskins of each other. They're all unique uh, gameplay. And we even put a bow on it for you. <laughs> there is a uh, new line called Something Wild, um, very uh, similar to something like Rummy. It's a set collection game. Uh, there's six different Disney SKUs currently in the line. And each one comes with a pocket pop that represents a character in that game. Um, really fun, dynamic, uh, up to four players, ages six and up. Um, so these are, um, I believe, seven and eight dollars respectively. Mm. So again, another great uh, cash wrap um, purchase, uh, you know, impulse purchase, um, stocking stuffer, you know, last minute gift kind of option. Yep. Well, I really appreciate you guys joining. Um, retailers, I appreciate you joining as well. We are a couple minutes over. Um, Derek just asked one last question. Does Funko have a online source for digital marketing assets, especially pre-created social media graphics? Uh, so we do not have those um, available, um, but if there is a need for them, uh, you know, on all of our retail pages, we do have, um, you know, lifestyle and product imagery. Um, I'm sure we can provide all the approved assets to Scott if there's any um, uh, need for them. For, for yes. um, I do know also that there is a lot of videos on the Marvel Battle World on the Funko YouTube page. Um, and there's also a couple of the cartoons, as Adam had mentioned, of uh, the actual official Marvel cartoons themselves and, and tying into that, which is really, really cool. Yep, and we do have sizzle reels for all the titles that we showed you today, um, similar to what we um, showed off with uh, Back to the Future. So those are you know, yep. embed them on your site. They're really great 30 second sizzle reels for each title. And if the guys or the retailers have any questions, guys, what's the best way for them to reach you guys? Is there a sales at Funko or is there a specific email you'd like them to have to be able to reach out and ask questions? I know a guy. You do? Okay. <laughs> I know a guy. Just a uh, guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Go ahead and have them send, a, 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 if, if they don't want to send it to you, want to send it directly to me, that's mm -hmm. Uh, if you have your pen and paper ready, mm -hmm. uh, we that's Jeremy M at Funco.com, J-E-R-E-M-Y at Funco, F-U-N-K-O dot com. Um, if you ever surprise the world and stump Scott, and stump Scott on anything, uh, you can, you're always welcome to reach directly out to me and then we'll, we'll tag team and help you out. No, no worries. No worries. Uh, I do get stumped, believe it or not. <laughs> so I just put it into chat as well. And then of course, retailers, you can always contact me. My email is smorris at gtsdistribution.com. You can always contact your sales rep, of course, and be able to get any questions answered from them. I hope this has been helpful. Again, greatly apologize for the disruption from Godzilla, but that's how, how powerful Godzilla is. So I hope that this has been good information for everybody leading into the holidays here. And if you have questions, do follow up and let us know. Until then though, guys, thank you very much from the Funko team. Appreciate y'all joining. Retailers, have a great week in your stores. Thanks so much. Take care, everyone.